Hello and welcome to my talk. I'm uh, really excited to have you here today and really excited to introduce you to the wild world of data policy. We're going to be talking about it in the past, present, and future. And my goal today is to connect you, the industry of data, with the policymakers that are trying to figure out how do we make data better in government. My name is Jake Pasner. Uh, I'm a research data specialist at the State Water Resources Control Board, and I'm excited to take you on this tour now. So let's start off with how did I get here? Well, actually, I grew up here in California on an organic farm in the foothills. Uh, we used the water that came from the ditch that supplied for, to us through the local irrigation district in order to farm. We did row crops, just like you can see here. My dad on the tractor, we grew butternut and delicious tomatoes. We've got happy farm dogs that drink the water too. So this is a place that I come from when I think about water. But my next step, took a pretty hard left turn, went right into the world of particle physics. I worked at the Large Hadron Collider for my PhD, where I did a lot of data science. You can see in the bottom right the control room for the Atlas experiment. This is a pretty complex experiment, the largest one on the planet, and some of the original big data thoughts were created here at CERN. This idea in Switzerland has spread throughout the world now as big data as we know it. Data scientists around the world can now do more depth analysis, just like we do at the Large Hadron Collider looking for the fundamental particles of nature. My next step, again, took me in an interesting direction. I found the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. This opportunity brings professionals like me and you into the Senate to advise, or Senate or House, and even the executive branch to advise on policy that is pertinent in our areas of interest. I worked in Senator Ron Wyden's office as part of the 2020 cohort, which you can see on the bottom right. I do want to say that my views are my own and do not reflect the opinions of Senator Ron Wyden, his office, or his staff. But the next step for me was to find a place where I could take my passions, my background, my data science and policy interests, and put them to work. So I joined the California Water Board, where they are working now to try and update our rights, um, our, our water rights data system. This means that all the people of California experiencing drought, wildfire, and just access to clean water can get better data about what's going on with our precious resource. So in hindsight, how did I really get here? It turns out that it's all about making information available to all. And for this purposes of this talk, I'll be talking about open data. So open data for all. And I wanna encourage you as part of this to come and join the government data gold rush that is happening right now. I hope by the end of this talk, you'll see that now is the moment to work within this space, either in the government, advising the government, or just attending our public comment sessions and different challenges that are being presented. But starting off with maybe something a little bit more material, where's the money right now? How is this gold rush happening? At the federal level, a $1.5 trillion infrastructure package has allocated around $11.5 billion for information management and IT modernization. This infusion of money can go to consultants, it can go to data infrastructure, and it is being used to update and modernize governance at our highest levels. In California, we have similar effects with our 300, nearly $300 billion budget with significant funding for data-driven decision-making. And in fact, this data-driven decision-making funding is what started the group that I'm now a member of. So what does this mean for industry? Well, when you go to the gold rush, it starts with prospecting. You need to be able to find where's the best stuff to get into, where's the pay dirt. In this case, it's data.gov at the federal level. At California, it's data.ca.gov. This has huge, unleash, huge untapped economic potential. Evaluated at somewhere between three and $5 trillion, open data in general, McKinsey makes this estimate because government really leads from the center. The policies that we implement will become the policies that spread across various different places through regulation and oversight. So opening this door really starts with the government. You can see that health data is worth a huge amount of money, GPS data, weather data, all of these pieces of information are collected by the federal government, 
However, we need to keep their privacy of, this, of, of individual citizens in mind. That's the responsibility of the government, and it's one that we take extremely seriously. So where do you come in is you reap what you sow. You can help us develop this valuable resource and build your future startup or your company through the data that is gained from our improvements to this, the interoperability of this data. Getting in on the ground floor means that you'll be able to help us build systems that work with your company and work with data industry in general. By advising this data policy for the good of the people and for the future of, the business, of your business, we can work together as partners. So what does it mean to make open data a reality in the modern environment? Well, let's start off with the basic idea. Everybody loves open data, right? We, we want to be building robotic dogs. We want flying cars. We want to have all of the fruits that we can dream of in our you know, techie minds. This is, this is what us data scientists love. Unfortunately, public concerns are growing. Uh, this means that there really are issues out there. The majority of Americans feel that they don't have control over the data that's collected, and they don't understand what it's being used for. For the government, this is pretty concerning because we work for the people. The elected representatives are also concerned about this because they want to be reelected. So with 78% of people not understanding how data is used, we have a lot of work to build transparency and trust and accountability into these systems. This is not fine. <laughs> so government jumps into action. Data policy to the rescue. We're trying to find solutions to these issues of people not knowing how their data is being used. If we make it more obvious to them, then it can be useful. If we make it more obvious to them and they feel they can buy into the system, then they're not afraid of the collection, that will they'll be less afraid of the collection of that information. If we can show them that it will be kept private, but still be made useful, that's improvements to our economy and protecting their privacy. So what are the issues? We do have some implementation struggles. Uh, for example, in 2010, the census released, as it always had every 10 years, the information that it had collected in aggregate. Unfortunately, with the ad advantages that have been created from artificial intelligence, by combining the information from this census with external data sets that were widely available, 17% of the United States population was re-identifiable. This was a huge public outcry, big problem. So when 2020 rolled around, the census tried to implement innovative technology policies. They decided to use differential privacy to try and add noise to these outputs, these output aggregate results in order to protect the individual's data. Unfortunately, this public input process uh, didn't go as planned, and the rollout was confusing to people, uh, especially leadership who were now looking at data that had a plus or minus on it that they didn't understand. Why is there an error bar? Why are you giving me a distribution instead of just a number? This means that our solution, which <laughs> looked like it was going to put out the fire, turned into its own fire. <laughs> so now we've got lawsuits that are being faced, and that's something that the government is really trying to avoid. Furthermore, we have people within the bureaucracies, and this is true of any large organization that has its own bureaucracies, people that have a fear of becoming obsolete. As we come in as the new wave of data people trying to push forward this data-driven ideology, those that have been working in paperwork government their whole life see this as a big problem. I like to think of this as the government is a big ship. It's trying to turn and everybody on the ship thinks everything's fine. Let's just keep going forward. Little do they know they're about to beach on the rocky shoulders, just like this big ship we see on the right. Only together can we avoid these issues and help everybody understand that this solution will help them. It can improve their workflow. It doesn't have to mean the end of their career. We can't ignore the potential here. Putting our heads in the sand, ignoring public opinion, thinking we'll just keep doing what we've always been doing will not work. So you and me, people who understand this data challenge, have this future in our hands right now. We can change the world. We can advise policy. We can jump in in all kinds of different ways to help make sure that the outcomes help the people, our businesses, and still protect those things that we hold dear. And by the way, 
ostriches don't actually put their heads in the sand and neither should we. So how did we get here? What, you know, why, why are we in this situation where we know that it's valuable, but we're not really able to take advantage of the information that is out there? Well, let's start off at something that you know well. Patrick regulation is bad for business. If you've ever talked to the people in your policy shops, they'll say it's really important that you follow government regulation. Government has to follow its own regulation too. So if it's patchwork and it's different between the European Union and California, for example, or as this globe shows on the right across the entire world, it makes it really difficult to do the right thing. People get really nervous, especially the lawyers, when you start talking about different rules and trying to be, you know, adhere to them. These inconsistent standards create huge issues for data scientists too, because if you're one group is trying to fulfill this obligation, this one's trying to fulfill this obligation, you're gonna end up with different databases that can't mesh very well, interoperability fail. Other lessons from the past. People said to themselves, okay, this is a big problem. We need to bring our data together. This is a valuable resource. All the way back in 1965, the National Data Service was proposed. This was statisticians, government evaluators, and industry professionals who were looking at labor data, financial data, and trying to make this an economic resource. So various different agencies got together and started thinking about how can we take our punch card data and our mountains of paperwork and our big spreadsheets, bring it all together in a centralized location so that we can accommodate both efficiency and improve savings for the people, have business insights into the decisions that they're making, and improve our efficiency in general as a government. So great, that idea, that piece of legislation, first, we fixed it. It's the future. We're flying around in cars. How's your robot dog doing, by the way? Kind of sounds like maybe we didn't make it. Maybe there, there really is a problem. And it turns out there was. 56% of Americans opposed this idea. They did not think that this was the way of the future. They did not understand that this was a solution that was begging to be implemented. And why? Because they were afraid, and, and rightly so. This is the era of Orwellian Big Brother is watching you. So this led the, to the 1974 Privacy Act. This act slammed the door on the National Data Service and ensured that any interoperability between data would be highly restricted making this process incredibly difficult and expensive if you wanted to share any information, even internally within the government. This led to huge data silos in agencies and between sub-agencies. This problem is difficult for us data scientists in the modern era, but we have to remember this was implemented in a time where people were concerned about papers that were being brought together. And cryptography was barely, barely entering the scene. We didn't have the technology to do something about it. So the good, the bad, and the ugly all came out here. Because there was no unified data, there were no unified data standards. We didn't have the ability to enforce the idea that maybe we should have the same headers for our tables. Maybe we should include metadata about how the information was collected. This is a big problem if you're looking at open data in the modern era. However, they did get some things right. They were concerned about your right to correct data. At the time, federal cre uh, credit agencies and financial data were important. They were become, coming under a lot of scrutiny. These agencies were building up. And so it was important for American people to be able to correct their data. Along with that, there needed to be transparency, the ability to see what data the government had on them. So they created systems of records notices, requiring agencies to fill out forms that informed the public people through the National Archives Record Administration about the data that they had. These ideas persist to this idea and are still good. They're built into a lot of the new things that we have, um, but there were other problems with this bill as we've talked about. Other issues, back in 1980, people just like us didn't like paperwork. <laughs> Congress took action and implemented the 1980 Paperwork Reduction Act. Again, they had this future brilliant idea. We're going to take these mountains of paperwork and we're going to do, reduce them down. We'll make it so that whenever a form has to change, there's a process that you have to go through so that things don't change too quickly and people can respond and, and businesses don't have to 
keep redoing all these things over and over. Unfortunately, this really good idea ended up being just a load of red tape for people filling out forms. It also means that if an agency wants to change a form, they have to go through a six to nine month process that is held at the Office of Management and Budget. This system makes it really difficult if you're a data scientist like me, trying to implement new forms or a new collection of data requests. If you have to wait nine months to change a radio button on your new, form, your new Google Sheet, you're probably just not gonna change it. And that leads to problems with data. So with all these issues, why is this a big hot topic right now? Well, in 2018, we had a big break. Open Data got a boost. The Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, a bipartisan effort to improve this idea. We, they knew, they knew that this was valuable, just like us. They were starting to see that the future of our economy depended upon these resources being available. And the government is in the business of helping our economy. It prioritized open data. It mandated standards that were lacking. It created a repository for all this information, data.gov. It reopened the doorway to government data interoperability from a policy standpoint. It gave the legal cover that was necessary for this. And their goal, their goal was data-driven decision-making, the pinnacle. It was all there in legislation. Okay, that's great. They opened the doorway, but how do we walk through it? We still don't have the standards implemented. There's, they're, they're to this day being written. There's still red tape over everything. How do we begin the process? Well, the process starts at the bottom. Just like data collection, you have to make sure that the initial process is solid. In our case, with the federal government, or when I, when, when I was working with the federal government, this means the State and Local Digital Services Act. I worked on this bill with uh, Senator Wyden's staff and helped introduce it last year. The idea here is to grow a data community from the ground up by putting chief data officers into agencies at the state and local level. The funding that we provide and the advice and systems that are built for them will lead to higher quality data collection. This is like planting the seeds of our open data future. With these pieces, we begin to build better data and open data then becomes more valuable. Okay, great. So now we're collecting better data if, if that bill becomes law and keep your fingers crossed. Uh, well, what happens then with the data silos? We've been given permission legally to share this information between uh, agencies, but there's no system under which to do it currently. And the reason is privacy issues. Like before with the National Data Service, people get pretty concerned when you start saying about bringing their records together. So the solution that I came up with while working with Senator Ron Wyden and his office was the Secure Research Data Network Act. This was actually introduced very recently into the, into the Senate. The idea here, and it's a bipartisan uh, group of senators that are pushing this idea, is to balance privacy and interoperability. This is the mandate for the federal government. And back in the National Data Service days, they didn't have cryptography like we do today. So we brought forward this idea that is being trying uh, being pushed, pushed around within higher circles and, and has been around actually for quite a while of secure multi-party computation. This idea that individual agencies, sub-agencies, groups that have been mandated to not share their data can have this algorithm come in, do the statistics, answer the questions that we have and bring only the aggregate together in a privacy preserving manner. This is the linchpin for privacy, uh, for private data within the federal government. And as it trickles down into those state level uh, CDOs, them too. We all rise together. So now that these ideas are out there and the legislation is moving, we'll see what, what comes out of these ideas. The real work can begin. This door is opening. Our chance to find that nugget inside of the pay dirt is starting to appear. And we can walk through together. Uh, the government and industry, hand in hand. So now that we've got these ideas that I got to work on and that are really circu circulating around in the highest echelons of our government, where's the action at right now? 
Well, I found that it was right back home for me. So I left Washington, D.C., moved back to California, and joined the modern gold rush of water. This is a huge problem. If you live in California, you know this is something that everybody, it's the third rail. <laughs> everybody knows about water. And this year, the driest 22-year period in the last 1,200 years, there's a huge need to change this. That's why it's getting priority attention. Last year, our department, the Division of Water Rights at the State Water Resources Control Board, had its first ever curtailment of water. This is a big, big change. We haven't done this before in, in, in this agency. This means that water really is becoming more critical, and the systems that oversee it need to advance too. And I don't really need to say it, but when water gets scarce, fires get worse. This one on the bottom left is something that makes me afraid because our farm in the, in the foothills is just like the little town of paradise. So let's make sure that we uh, use this resource in a way that protects our people, protects our economy, and protects our forests, our, our, our environment. So let's get down to the numbers here. This is a big problem. And uh, we love seeing big reservoirs full of water like that on the right because for our GDP, just agriculture, which is estimated somewhere in the ballpark of two to six percent of our GDP, 68 to 204 billion dollars. This is a huge, huge issue. And this water is also used for many industrial needs. It's used to pump uh, fuels. It's, it's used in the oil industry. It's used to irrigate five, over five million acres of farmland. 30 million people, over 30 million people drink this water in California. And to talk about this from a, not just how much there is, 200,000 Californians are drinking unsafe water per day. We need to have data to solve these problems, critically for our economy and our environment. So the water rights data revolution begins. We're moving upward and that's the name of our group, updating water rights data for California. I'm a member of the data governance team at the board. And for me, this, lies at that critical path of making open data available so that we can solve problems for people at all levels, whether it's my dad out on our farm using the water from our ditch, or it's the huge industries that use our water across California, or maybe just somebody trying to get some water out of a tap. Now, this means that Upward has a big mandate. Uh, the, this kind of investment into a large team and large contracts means that our leadership, what we create, will build the playbook for other agencies that try to follow in our footsteps, both within California and in other agencies. And we're not just talking about water agencies. Everybody's going to need to do this. So we're trying to figure out how do we grow a data-driven community? This is something that you've probably thought about a lot about in your organization. How do we build the future of data interoperability? Well, luckily, Water rights data is open data. This is information that you can go look at right now. I encourage you to do it. Unfortunately, the data standards have been lacking and they've changed through years. You know, way back in the 1800s, we did not have the same standards for data, certainly, as we do now. The board has already started to work on these problems, but taking our old data, cleaning it, making it useful, and then presenting it in a way that's important for Californians. That's our work. So how can you get involved in these ideas? And I'm not just talking about water. There's a lot of places. The government needs from you. Explaining tech, we need your expertise. We need you to help explain technology to Congress. These are people that really know this is important. They're passionate about it, but they don't have the expertise. So we need translators, people who can say, you know, why, why is the cloud important without having to talk too much, say the word data too many times? We need new technologies to break down silos, like secure multi-party computation. But just new technologies won't cut it. We need people that know how these solutions solve the policy issues. That's why I'm here today talking to you about the policy issues. You can probably think of some solutions out there that I won't know about. We need experts in data governance, people who understand that it's not just creating the standard, it's implementing the standard. It's educating people about the standard. 
showing them the value of it in their workflow, making sure that they see this is something for them, not something that's trying to replace them. We also need unique voices that help build the trust of the people giving us our data. We need people that can speak from their personal experience and, and tell us why it is that they don't want to give up their data. What will make them trust the government? How can we build that relationship between the people providing the data and the people that need to use it? We also need your passion. We need people that want to see this futuristic world come to reality. We need you to be good advocates. And you can do this from any position. But because I do work at the water board, why don't you come join us and help us make water work? You can check out Cal Careers and look for research data specialist positions like the one I have. It's a good job. And feel free to hit me up at my email here. I'd be happy to help you. Or if water isn't your issue, you can take it up with a lot of other places. California is hiring specialists with familiar, familiarity with extract transform load pipelines, data governance, artificial intelligence, and GIS. If you have these backgrounds and you care about these things, this might be a way for you to understand what's going on, make the data available, and benefit from it in many different ways, as the rest of America does too. You could join in a different capacity. Maybe you don't want to take a full-time job. Maybe you want to just try something out. You can be a fellow that codes the future, just like I was. You can do a tour of duty in the government, the Presidential Innovation Fellowship, a brilliant fellowship that can be in the executive grant branch. Or maybe you just got out of college. You could join the United States Digital Corps as a fellow. If you want to work in the legislative or executive, but you can't make your mind up, the California Council on Science and Technology and the American Academy for the Advancement of Science have opportunities, and I'd be more than happy to help you apply for these opportunities. In the legislative branch, we have Tech Congress built for people just like you and me. This is the people that I worked with at an, on a daily basis and the people leading the future of data policy. Other groups that you might be interested to watch if you're just trying to update your RSS feed, the Data Coalition is working on these policies and was a partner that I worked with in Senator Wyden's office. Federal Chief Information and Chief Data Officer Councils are building these playbooks at the federal level, and they have public comment periods that you can join. They have advisory committees that are built up for these issues too. You can look at air groups like the Coleridge Initiative, which is helping implement these policies at state and local levels. They're educating these people, these staff, on how to use data. You can look at NABA, a corporation that's doing similar ideas, government technology. The Aspen Tech Policy Hub. You can look at the, which has great innovators in policy and, and leaders telling these stories, making them approachable. The United States Digital Response, doing this good work too, a partner um, on, on State and Local Digital Services Act. The US Digital Service, which is actually within the government doing the hard work of building these ideas, or 18F at the General Services Administration doing that same thing. But to pitch something that's near and dear to my heart, Engineers and Scientists Acting Locally, a nonprofit that I'm the technology director for, is building these playbooks so that you can get involved at your city level. Maybe you've got, maybe you've got something that you, you want to monitor and you just want to make that data available to your local government. We've got playbooks to help you help you get involved, how to talk to your representatives, how you could support the legislation that I've talked today, if it's interesting to you. And if that's interesting to you, please shoot me an email at my eSAL here on the screen. But my final pitch, if you don't, if you don't feel like any of these other things are the, right, are the right one for you, check out our Water Data Symposium and Challenge. It's concurrent with this Data and AI Summit, but it has challenges that you can join in at any time. You can come look at our GitHub repo where this code is being actively edited, or you can view previous water data challenges where we've worked with experts like you to improve the water that the, the, the data that we collect for water. Your expertise can change this world. So coming soon with your help, that pipe dream that we all have in our mind can be a little bit closer. We are excited to have you join our teams in any capacity and I hope that you'll reach out to me soon. Thank you all for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this. And if any of it seems interesting to you, shoot me an email or check out our repo. Go to one of these public comment periods. Get involved in any way that you feel comfortable with. 
And in any case, I'll see you in the future. Bye for now.